Um, thank you, Michael and, and Richard, for having me today. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to get to talk to this group. Uh, my name is Chris Peterson. Um, I am a staff scientist here at the Fred Hutch, and I'm also a research assistant professor at the nearby University of Washington um, School of Medicine. I've been involved in our Defeat HIV Martin Delaney Collaboratory, uh, the group that, that Michael mentioned um, since its inception in, in 2011. Um, and, and have really focused on gene therapy approaches for HIV functional care and remission. Um, and I'll be reviewing our work and, and the work of many others today. So just as a, a very broad overview to start, for those of you who haven't been to a gene therapy talk before, the, the, the basic um, idea here is, is I, I think it's, as many of you know, um, genes are, are the, the, the functional and, and physical unit of heredity. So there are about 25,000 of them that we all uh, inherit from our two parents in, in two copies uh, for the most part of, of each gene. And what we're trying to do in gene therapy is repair those genes or replace those genes when they're the cause of, of certain illnesses. And also when they, in some cases, can enable susceptibility to viruses like HIV. So a lot of words on this slide, but the, the general idea here is that what, what we are trying to do is, is change or uh, introduce a correct copy of a gene into a somatic cell. And I've highlighted somatic cell because that's actually very important. Um, those are cells of the body that compose all of your tissues and organs, basically everything except your, your reproductive cells. So it's a, a completely different topic of discussion, but to, to touch on the part that we're not trying to make any what quote unquote germline changes to the genome. We think that's a, a very um, ethically uh, controversial area and, and needs a lot more study before we would go into that uh, to that realm. So what we're doing here is changing a person's own cells that are specific to various diseases, cancer, viruses, etc. Those can be very broadly classified as gene addition, where we're, we're essentially if replacing a defective gene by inserting a correct copy um, anywhere else in the genome or gene editing, which is where we're really focusing in on a gene that needs to either be inactivated or corrected and doing that at its native locus. That is where that gene exists within the 25,000 genes um, in your chromosomes in the genome. So specifically for, for HIV, what we're interested in doing are two things. One is to defend uninfected cells from virus entry. And, and really the, the strategy that we focus the most on is gene editing of the CCR5 gene. And I'll talk a little bit about more, a little bit more about this in a few slides. But the general idea here is that CCR5 is a gene that's needed for HIV to get into, most strains of HIV to get into cells. We can knock it out and it's been shown that that's safe. Um, and I'll talk more about that. It's becoming more clear though, that just defending cells by itself is gonna be a very high bar for us to reach. And so, the other thing that we're interested in doing is coming up with ways to enable the immune system to attack cells that are infected. And we're specifically, again, looking at cells that are persistently infected with the virus. So this idea of HIV persistence is that people have the virus and they take art, but there's still cells that need to be targeted to clear or, or those cells will start making virus again. So examples here are CAR T cells, which is what I'm mainly gonna talk about today. Um, and we're also interested in making B cells that express antibodies that will neutralize the virus. And we're also finally wanting to make sure that we control where and when these cells operate. So they're specifically dealing with HIV infected cells and, and having no other function. So this is just a, a conceptual look at, at what we're up against. And, and this is a few years old now, but I, I think still rings true. And, and that is when a person is infected with HIV, which is basically at time zero here, they'll have a lot of um, RNA that encodes the HIV virus in their bloodstream. And this is how we can detect if people um, are infected called a, a plasma viral load assay. There are a lot of different cell types in the body that, that can be infected. Many of them are T cells and different kinds of T cells. And, and here those different T cells are schematized in different colors, the red, the green, and the yellow. And when a person starts antiretroviral therapy or ART, a lot of those cells, all, or all of those cells, as far as we know, will stop making virus and, and they won't be able, there won't be any viral replication anymore. But a lot of those cells are gonna persist and, and this is the main problem. So those cells in red, even over time, some cells will disappear and, and they will no longer persist and can't, can't uh, make more infectious virus. But a very small number, thought to be about one in a million of them will. 
Um, these are found in the bloodstream at very low levels, but they're also found in, found in many tissues. And I'm showing you here lymph nodes in the spleen, the gastrointestinal tract, and the brain are, are three of the, the so-called um, viral reservoirs that we're very specifically focusing on to try to clear out um, all of these infected cells. And again, this is a tall order. And there have a lot, been a lot of approaches that have been introduced over the, the um, scale of, of the HIV epidemic that have, have tried to, to uh, address this. So that's what I'm talking about here is, is how do we get to an HIV cure? And, and there are three main strategies that I'm outlining here. The, the one that you probably heard the most about is, is formally referred to as latency reactivation. It's also referred to as shock and kill. Um, uh, kick and kill, various other strategies. And, and the general idea here is, is to have some sort of, of pill or treatment that you can take that's going to wake up those latently infected cells that are otherwise invisible to the immune system. And then the immune system should be able to clear them. This is a, a really great concept and a lot of work continues on it. But um, the, the fact is that a lot of these haven't worked as well in patients as, have, as they have in preclinical models. And so what we and many others have been interested in doing is starting to combine this and asking the question, would this uh, approach work better if we combined it with some other mechanisms? One of those others is, again, very broadly referred to as immunotherapy. And, and here I'm referring to broadly neutralizing antibodies, for example. This is basically just giving someone an intravenous infusion of antibodies that will neutralize the virus. Um, if you've heard for, for COVID-19, there are a couple companies, uh, Regeneron and Eli Lilly, have, brought, have neutralizing antibodies uh, against the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So, so this is an approach that's taken um, for other infectious diseases as well as autoimmune diseases. Again, for HIV, it's proven promising, but the problem is, is it has a very short half-life. So it works for a while, but then those antibodies sort of go away and the virus is still sticking around. But we think that combining it with shock and kill, for example, could, could be really effective. What I'm gonna focus on is, is the, the third uh, uh, aspect to this, which is gene therapy and gene editing. And we think that the synergy between the approaches I've just talked about with you for, for gene therapy um, and gene editing could, could synergize very well with immunotherapy and, and these latency reactivation strategies. I'm gonna highlight that a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about today really has come from uh, lessons that we've learned from cancer. Um, interestingly, a lot of the technologies like CAR T cells that I've talked about today were originally developed on the back of, of HIV research. Um, for cancer, they were developed in a way that worked very well. And so what we're trying to do is take back those lessons that we learned from the cancer field and reapply them um, for HIV in combination with these other strategies here. So again, as uh, Michael mentioned, we're part of one of uh, six Martin Delaney collaboratories here in Seattle. Each of them have, have really well um, circumscribed scientific foci, but we're focused mostly on gene therapy. But I want to highlight that a lot of the background and, and, and concepts that we're talking about here are, are those that have been shared by all of these groups, um, as well as others around the country and, and other HIV care and research labs around the world. So there are a number of clinical cases that are, are really the benchmarks for what we're trying to do with gene therapy. and and, and the interesting thing to note is that none of these patients were treated with a, a gene therapy per se, but, but the way that they were treated has really guided um, our efforts. The, the three that, that you know best, uh, I, I think, would be Timothy Brown, um, our, our good friend who passed away um, last year, Adam Castillejo, the, the London patient, and one of the Boston patients, uh, Gary Steinkolb. And I, I show this slide a lot, and, and really what I, what I want to get across here are two things. Number one is that we, we do see cure or, or functional remission in, in, in Tim Brown and, and, in, and in Adam. And we think that the, the unique aspect that led to the, the cure in these two patients was what I'm highlighting in green here, which is a naturally occurring mutation in CCR5 called CCR5 Delta 32. And again, a, a lot of you have probably heard of this, but for those of you who haven't, there's a small population of people around the world who don't express this gene. And, and so we know that you can walk around to be totally, mostly or totally healthy if you don't um, express CCR5. And, and Tim and, and Adam received a bone marrow transplant where the cells had that mutation and, and it essentially replaced their entire immune system with those CCR5 deleted cells. HIV wasn't able to replicate anymore. And that's what we're uh, calling cure at this point. 
Now we combine, we compare that to Gary and a couple other cases where the bone marrow transplants again were, were uh, taking place for cancer as well as for Tim and Adam, um, but they didn't have that CCR5 mutation. And, and, and since they didn't, we, th we hypothesized that that was the reason that between 12 and 41 weeks later, they did rebound um, and their virus did come back and, and they went on antiretroviral therapy again. So the other thing that I want to emphasize is that these treatments are, are, are highly involved. Um, they're, they're quite toxic and, and they're really not uh, applicable for the general population. So another thing that we're really focused on is making this a safer and, and more broadly applicable, applicable type of therapy. I'm just highlighting here for, for Tim, this is one of many really nice reports that was, that was uh, published by his Dr. Gero Hutter. And this shows the, the fact that he actually went through two rounds of allogeneic stem cell transplantation. He had relapse of his cancer. This is back in 08. And as you can see from the blue line, his CD4 T cell counts rebounded after he went through this, uh, after he went through this transplantation, but his viral load was never seen again. Now, the, uh, you know, I've been showing these two slides for a number of years. And, and unfortunately, I have to add Tim to this list of those who went through these transplants, but unfortunately succumbed to their malignant disease. And that's been one of the major problems with this type of therapy is that we're, we're, we, we need to focus on it in cancer patients because in an otherwise healthy um, person living with HIV, this isn't going to be a reasonable approach. So we're focusing on these so-called AIDS malignancy patients and, and, and Tim was, was one of those. Um, the, the other one that I'd like to highlight here is, is a patient known as the Essen patient in Germany. And, and this was one instance where it seemed like the virus was able to break through through the stem cell transplantation um, process. So this is another good um, summary from, from Giro a few years ago, comparing um, the Berlin patient, Tim Brown, to, to the Essen patient. There's a few things that I want to highlight here. The first is that when the, the patients come off antiretroviral therapy is very important. So if I go back to, to Tim's slide here, you can see that he had a, a brief art interruption um, after he was diagnosed with AML and that showed that he still had very uh, robustly replicating virus. But then when he went on antiretroviral therapy, again, the virus went back down to undetectable levels. And the really remarkable thing about his case and, and very unique is that he came off his antiretrovirals the day of his first stem cell transplant. For other patients, that's, that's led to a lot of toxicity. And, and what we've learned in our preclinical studies is, is that Tim was, was very lucky that, that everything went very well because in a lot of cases, um, we, we would expect things to, to not go as well. In the case of the Essen patient, there was even a higher bar, or a bigger challenge because this patient came off his antiretroviral therapy a week before transplant. And we think that this is important because it basically gives the virus a head start. So the virus can start replicating again even before we, we, we try to treat it with the stem cell transplant. So we think that this is one reason um, that the Essen patient, with the virus in that patient was able to break through. The other reason is that the Essen patient's virus has had an ability to uh, replicate without the CCR5 gene. As I said, most, but not all viruses need that to replicate. And the fact that he had these viruses in his system already really primed them to, to repopulate after um, the antiretroviral therapy. Um, was, was taken away. Now, there was a lot that, that we learned, but there was a lot of just single case studies, as I showed a couple slides ago, a lot of patients in, in these HIV AIDS malignancy cohorts that had very interesting and unique stories. But the, the story of Adam, um, aka the London patient, was our first ability to really say this, this is a trend um, that we're seeing. And just to compare with Adam, the, the, the two things that we were able to was able to be applied from, from lessons we learned before is number one, to give these patients plenty of time after their transplant for their immune systems to recover before taking ART away. ART is basically, we think that the cover and, and the protection, so while we're replacing the immune system, which takes a long time, ART needs to stay there to keep the virus at bay. And, and so in the London patient's case, it was 16 months after transplantation um, that he came off ART. And again, he was in a very good spot as far as only having these types of viruses that, that use CCR5. So by taking CCR5 away um, with that stem cell transplant, that worked very well um, in this clinical case. So again, as, as I mentioned, um, doing an allogeneic stem cell transplant, which is taking another person's bone marrow hematopoietic stem cells and putting them into a recipient 
It's a very toxic procedure. Um, it's, a, it's a very low percentage procedure to get a bone marrow match, as most of you probably know. And then you also have to find a patient that has this naturally occurring CCR5 mutation, which is also very rare. So what we're interested in doing is coming up with stem cell gene therapies for a patient's own cells. And, and the idea here is that we would introduce that genetic modification into a hematopoietic stem cell. Again, I want to very clearly differentiate that these are not embryonic stem cells. These are not the types of, of renewing stem cells, for instance, in, in the case in China where, where embryonic stem cells were added with, with CCR5. Um, hematopoietic stem cells are somatic cells and they only repopulate the bloodstream. So we can take a, per, a person's hematopoietic stem cells, introduce this modification, and then that same modification is gonna be passed off to all of the cells that come from that stem cell. And that includes uh, T lymphocytes, as, as you can see here, and, and, and many other cell types that are, are relevant for infection. So the big pro for this is that this is lifelong protection. Hematopoietic stem cells, by definition, are meant to stick around for a person's entire life. So they're going to be there and they're going to continue to pump out these HIV resistant cells um, for the rest of the patient's natural life. But the problem is that there's a lot of toxic approaches that are needed to get these cells to stick around or graft um, in the patient. So for the life of the patient, um, this, is, this is something that has to be weighed. In the case of cancer patients, these are therapies that they would go under anyway, that makes sense. But for an otherwise healthy individual, some of these stem cell therapies, we really need to dial down the toxicity. And that's a, a very active area of research right now. So in the meantime, in addition to the work that, that we do on stem cell gene therapy, we're, we're asking the question of whether we can just modify one cell type in the body. So instead of having a stem cell where all the cells are modified, specifically we're interested in focusing on uh, a, a couple of different cell types. One is B cells. As I mentioned, B cells make all of your antibodies in the body. So instead of having just a, an infusion or a shot where you get antibodies and they last for weeks or months, but not forever, what we're interested in doing is using gene therapies to reprogram B cells so they can make those antibodies um, for the entire body, again, for as, as long as, as um, these B cells can stick around. What I'm really gonna focus on today though are uh, T cell uh, approaches. So specifically, I'm gonna focus on chimeric antigen receptors or CARs. Um, there's other very analogous um, uh, uh, approaches that I won't get into using T cell receptors, which are more of a native sort of, of gene that T cells use to recognize viruses and other pathogens. I'm gonna talk about CARs, which are sort of a chimeric way of, of reaching the same approach. So this is a, a, a cool image that I like to show um, that was published in a science news article a little over a year ago. And, and again, this is coming back to cancer. So what we're showing here in blue is a cancer cell. And this is a CAR T cell that has recognized that cancer cell and is docked and is going to insert proteins into that leukemia cell that's going to kill it. And this is a general concept for all of our T cell therapies that we're trying to get across. We wanna make our CAR T cells here in red be able to recognize one type of cell. In our case, this is an HIV infected cell, but other groups make them recognize cancer as, as well as other infectious um, diseases as well. So really the, the, the poster child for this is Emily Whitehead. And, and many of you might've heard this story, but she was the first person to receive CAR T cells back or receive uh, CAR T cells for cancer and have this very effective response. And this was back in May, 2012. And she's become a, a great advocate for, for cancer gene therapy and, and has, uh, has a foundation that's shown here. She's coming up on her ninth year of cancer, fr cancer free in, in May. And really the, the work that we've built on for HIV is built on really the, the heroic experiences of her and many other cancer patients that have received these therapies. So this is a schematic of how the process looks. Um, we, we can take uh, blood from a patient and we can purify T cells um, from, from that blood sample. Um, there's ways that we can actually get a lot more T cells. And, and in any case, we get these, these T cells and then we can insert a gene that, that encodes our chimeric antigen receptor or CAR. And we insert that into the genome um, of the T cell. That will then uh, express at the surface of that T cell, what's known as, as the CAR molecule. And that is programmed to recognize a certain part of a virus or cancer. So we'll grow up millions or billions of, of these CAR T cells, and then we can infuse them back into the patient. And as is shown here on the left, in the case of cancer, 
we have these little antigens in green that these CAR T cells are programmed to specifically recognize. And when they see them, they dock, as you saw in that blue and, and uh, red figure, and then kill that cancer cell. What we'd like to do is uh, the same thing for HIV. And in this case, what we're taking advantage of is the fact that when the virus infects a cell, um, it, it uses a couple different proteins, as you can see here in blue, uh, is CD4, which is the main receptor, and then CC. CR5, which is the co-receptor that I told you about. But the, the virus is also going to express these proteins that, that are at the cell surface, and that's what we want our CAR molecule um, to recognize, these little white circles. So I'm showing you the same thing here, sort of in a different way. Um, on the right is what I just showed you with a virus coming to, to dock at the surface of a cell here, and then first interacting with the CD4 protein, and then the CCR5 protein, and then it gets into the cell. And then it basically goes through a replication process inside the cell. And what you're seeing on the left is what happens right before a new virus is made, is that you have all these little viral particles that are at the cell surface, these viral proteins. What we're trying to do is, is make a cell that will recognize these cells. And we're taking advantage of, in our case, three main points. Number one is, is CD4 and the fact that CD4 is really designed to recognize this. And number two is that we can engineer that CD4 in a different way so it can talk to the T cell. So that process is shown here. So we've got our, what we refer to as our CD4 CAR T cell here, where in, in, in brown, you can see the, the parts of the CAR molecule that tell the cell to do a certain function. And, and so when the CD4 docks with the, the virus protein on an infected cell, that tells that CAR T cell to kill that infected cell. That T cell is only going to do so if it sees and interacts with this little viral protein right here. Otherwise, it should have no effect on any other cell um, in the body. And once that happens, then the, that CAR T cell is able to send signals to tell the infected cell to die. And, and, and that's basically what we're getting at. That's about as far as I'll get in the weeds of all, all the mechanistics here, but just wanted to go through um, how this process really works. Now, this isn't new. I, I've, I've really highlighted that for cancer, this has really come about in the past roughly 10 years um, with, with, the, with the pediatric cases that I just told you about. But CAR T cells were actually first uh, described for HIV back in the late 80s and, and early 90s in a series of reports I'm showing you here where they were shown to work very well in a, in a tissue culture dish to clinical trials. And, and the clinical trials, unfortunately, at that time, were not super effective, but they did show that the process was at least safe. And, and so the charge since then has been to make them more effective while maintaining that, that really high safety profile that was observed back in the, the late 90s and early 2000s. So this is the way that the, the process works. And, and all of the work that I do is in the non-human primate model. And, and this is really the, one of the key preclinical models for HIV disease because what we can do is infect these animals with the same very analogous sorts of viruses um, that patients are infected with. These are called SHIVs, the S stands for simian. So it's sort of a simian version of HIV. And then we can put them after they're infected on the same antiretroviral drugs that, that patients receive. And so we can set up a model where we have the suppressed infection and the virus persists and it does all the other things um, that I've told you about so far. We can then enrich T cells, again, the same way that I told you that we do for patients. Um, and we can isolate those cells and grow them up in a dish. And then we can use our various gene modification and gene therapy tools to program those cells however we want. And, and the two ways that, that I'm going to focus on today are one that, that enables these cells to attack infected cells, and that's with our CAR transgene. And number two is to defend those cells from, them, from themselves becoming infected. And that's what we do um, with CCR5 gene editing. So as I mentioned, the other big advantage of this approach is, is that when we uh, take T cells out of a patient or an animal model and put them back in, we don't have to have these toxic conditioning regimens. Whereas for stem cells, we have to quote unquote, make room for those cells. So we have to kill off some of the cells that are there. So the stem cells have a reason to stick around. T cells will stick around uh, without as much trouble. So basically we can take these T cells out of the animal, do nothing else and put them back in. And this is something that's been very successful in our, our animal models as, as well as in, in clinical trials, um, especially for cancer. And, and we now have two FDA approved um, CAR T cell therapies for cancer, or actually three now. Um, so we infuse those 
CAR T cells back in the animal and, and really all the experiments that we're, that we're doing in the lab are, are asking the question, how well does this work? If, if we take any retroviral therapy away, um, do we see the virus come back or can we blunt the ability to which it comes back or can we totally um, get rid of it? So the story I'm gonna tell you about today is, is really focused around the data that you see here. And we, we performed the process I just showed you in, in four macaques. And what we were able to see is in two of the macaques in the bottom in purple and red, we were able to put the CAR T cells in and, and that's the therapy that's shown in, in the white, gray and black circles. But then when we take ART away, which is that gray box, we saw the virus rebound. So in two of the four animals that we gave this treatment to, we didn't see much of an effect, although we did have some hints that I'll talk about in a minute. But in the, then in the other two animals, we saw number one, that the virus took longer to come back. This is in the green and blue. And in one of the animals, it just kind of sputtered away and, and got to a point where we really couldn't even detect it anymore in the blood. So this is just another way of showing that data that even in the animals where uh, we did see the virus come back, there, there was a delay. And, and so when we compare the, the four animals that we gave this treatment to, to a, a, a cohort of controls, 24 animals that didn't receive the CAR T cells, you can see that we had a significant time and, and how long the virus came to take back. Now it, it wasn't zero, even in our, our blue animal here, which did the best, we did see some virus, but the levels were very, very low. So again, I, what I'm gonna talk about is, is what we think happened in this case. And, and this was very exciting for us in, in saying that this CAR T cell approach for HIV can work. And we wanted to ask why did it work? And, and the first thing that, that was very clear to us is the CAR T cells we, we devised are, are gonna to have to be very specifically made for various diseases. And, and so the way that CAR T cells are made for cancer, in addition to having that cancer specific CAR molecule, we have to grow them up in a different way and give them different factors that they like and factors that they don't like to control growth and maybe make them grow less. And, and so this is a process that, that we outlined here. And this was done by Blake who um, worked on this project very closely with me and is now um, holding down a really great job at one of the CAR T cell uh, private companies in town. The other thing that we learned that, that we think is gonna be important, not just for HIV is that for lack of a better word, CAR T cells for HIV are, are needier than, than other types of CAR T cells. And, and we think that's because when you have a cancer or leukemia, you've got billions and billions of these cancer cells in some cases circulating around the body. And the CAR T cells work by seeing the target that they need to kill. If, if they can't see it, they kind of disappear and go away and, and stop working. And, and because there's so many cancer and leukemia cells, that's most likely one reason why these CAR T cells for cancer have worked so well. But if you're a person living with HIV and you're taking your antiretroviral therapy uh, medications every day, you're gonna have very, very few of those infected cells and, and the CAR T cells, CAR -T -cells are gonna ha have a hard time finding them. So what I'm showing you here in the middle is what we refer to as an OM cell or an OM boost. And that's basically putting in an artificial source of this antigen to keep the CAR T cells going and telling them that they need to stick around. And as they expand, though that actually makes it easier for them to find the truly infected cells um, that exist in, at very low levels throughout the body. The last thing is I, I showed you those two animals that uh, actually did not control the virus as well. What we were subsequently able to show is if we give them again, a, a, a therapy that's been shown to work for cancer, which are antibodies against um, certain cellular pathways known as immune checkpoints, we were able to renew those CAR T cells. So we think that when this therapy is not working, the reason it's not working is that there's just too many of these targets to see, especially after we take antiretroviral therapy away and all of these infected cells rebound. So to keep them going, um, we're using these uh, cancer drugs that will help these T cells keep working and keep on going instead of becoming exhausted. So this is a publication, everything that I just told you is uh, something that we were very excited to publish um, last summer. This was sort of our first COVID project was to write all of this up um, while we were working from home and get it published in, in the journal Blood. And what I'm showing you here on the right is really the summary of everything I just told you. So this is published as, as the, the visual abstract for this paper. And again, to, to review what, what I've told you is that we have our CD4 CAR T cells I'm showing here in orange. And if we supply those in the body, 
with these, these just parts of the virus, an antigen or a vaccine, you could really think of it as. That vaccine is going to tell these CAR T cells to keep working and to proliferate. And then when we take antiretroviral therapy away, which I'm showing in gray, in some cases we saw that this led to a stable virus remission. And, and in some cases we had to add a, a second aspect, which was this blockade of, of a gene called PD-1 that's involved in immune exhaustion. So we've got a roadmap now, and really where we're going from here is, is trying to develop ways to make this as streamlined as possible, and, and as I'll talk about in the second part of the talk, um, applicable in, in more resource-limited settings. Before moving on, on to that second part, the other, one, the other thing I want to highlight is that everything that we did in the monkey model was designed to um, support a, a clinical trial that was being done by our colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, Pablo Tebas is someone that some, most of you probably know is a really well-known and respected HIV clinician. Um, he, along with Jim Riley, who's a, a friend of ours at UPenn, set up this, this clinical trial where they, they did a very similar sort of, of therapy to what I just showed you. So they made their CAR T cells in yellow. Um, they were administered to the patient at that first dotted blue line. And then those patients came off art at different times after they received it and then had a lot of follow-up, as you can see here in blue, dark blue, light blue, pink, and gray. And they were able to just publish this um, a few weeks ago, or I think just a week ago, actually, in JCI. And Pablo is the lead author here, along with Carl June, who's really the father of this therapy for cancer, um, and our colleague, Jim Riley. And they saw very similar things to what we saw, not necessarily that the virus disappeared completely, but they were able to delay the time that it took the virus to rebound. And that tells us that we are having an effect and so the, the goal then is really to tune in these therapies and, and tune them up so that we can go from a delay to, to a, a true cure. So what's next from, from this angle is making the CD4 car, CD4 car molecule better. Um, what I'm referring to here is playing nice with the immune system. Sometimes the immune system sees our therapies as, as foreign and, and restricts them and, and clears them just the way it would a virus. So we have to convince the immune system that we're, we're there to help. Um, that, that's something that we're very focused on. And we also are looking at different ways that these cars can work. Some of these cars have a lot of function for a short time, which I'm calling a quick burst. Others, others of them have less of a function, but they do it over a longer period. And we're coming to think that it's probably both that we'll need. And, and so one of the things that we're trying to balance is how much of each of those um, we wanna go with. This idea of, of vaccinating the CD4 CAR T cells is, is something that we think is really novel and is going to be very important. Um, we're using a strategy right now that, that isn't gonna go forward into the clinic for a number of reasons that I'm happy to talk about later, but instead what we're proposing in, in a new project that is, is gonna be reviewed soon is to use the same sort of technology that's in, in the uh, vaccines that many of you have gotten for COVID-19. And this is so-called um, lipid nanoparticles. So these lipid nanoparticles have obviously, obviously didn't done a very great job at vaccinating um, many, of, uh, many of us against COVID-19. Um, and we're gonna use that same sort of technology to vaccinate our CAR T cells so they'll, put, so they'll continue to search out uh, latently infected cells in the body. And then finally, we wanna plug in our gene therapy tools, not just to inactivate CCR5, but also to uh, target these immune checkpoint proteins, again, with the goal of making these T cells um, function for a longer period. So in the second part of the talk, I'm going to focus on everything that I'm showing you here, which is all of the work that needs to go in um, to making the CAR T cell products that I just showed you. And you can see that there are a lot of people that are involved in this process. There's the person that's actually handling the cells in, in the biosafety cabinet there. There's the person that's monitoring to make sure they're doing that right. There's the person that's writing down everything that the monitoring person is doing. So there's a lot of people involved in this process and that gets to be very tricky and very pricey. So these are slides I stole from my colleague, Jen Adair here in Seattle, just again, schematizing how this process works, that if we're gonna take cells out of the bloodstream to do this, we, we have to start with billions of cells that we're going to collect from the patient. We then use very specialized machinery that's going to, to isolate from those billions of cells, the millions of cells in the case of T cells um, that, that we want to uh, modify. We're gonna mo then modify them with uh, our, our uh, lentiviral vectors, which are, are schematized here. So those vectors are gonna carry our transgene, in this case, the CAR. 
we're going to mix those with the cells, and then those vectors are going to integrate it at uh, random places in, in the genome. And then we have to make sure those cells are good to go before we put them back into the patient. And for, for our stem cell approaches, which is CD34 here, that can take two to four days. For T cells, it can take up to two weeks. So this is a lot of person power and a lot of person hours to make this work. And Jin's slide that I like more than any other is, is shown here, which is the, the sites where this can happen, which is, which is the crosses, as you can see. And these are all in very developed areas of the world and in places, unsurprisingly, where the HIV epidemic is, is not persisting as severely as it is, for example, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So the question that we wanna ask then is, instead of having all of these patients come to the treatment, since they're so geographically disparate, we wanna be able to bring treatments to the patient. And this is a concept that we refer to as in vivo delivery and, and really is, is ending up constituting about half of what we do. So we wanna make our therapies better and we also wanna make them more applicable and easier to administer. So this is from a, a schematic that, that Hans-Peter and I wrote after um, Adam's case was published to the London patient. And again, this is telling you the same thing, that, that these traditional gene therapy approaches that we would use to cure HIV as well as cancer revolve, involve removing cells from the body. In this case, I'm showing you taking stem cells out of the bone marrow, plating them in a, in a culture dish, uh, modified it, my, modifying and putting them back. And again, this is a multi-day process, taking a lot of people, a lot of instrumentation and a lot of other specialized equipment. Instead, what we want to do is package all of those same technologies into something that we can administer through an, an intravenous injection. And this is something that, that has, has really been um, championed by Mike McCune, who we've worked quite a bit with for, for these uh, approaches uh, and support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation where he is, as well as the National Institutes of Health that I want to highlight um, their partnership in these experiments as well. So in the last few minutes, I'm, I'm just really briefly going to go over where our in vivo delivery approaches stand. This is something that, that is, is really at the cutting edge, and, and we're still learning a lot about the best way to do it. Um, there's really two broad classes. One are viral vectors, and these are the same sorts of viral vectors that we would use to incubate with cells if they were in a dish. But in this case, we're just applying those vectors directly to the patient. Um, AAV or adeno-associated virus is, is one that's already FDA approved for, for a couple of genetic diseases. Um, adenovirus is, is a platform that some of you are aware of. Uh, Hans Peter has, has founded a company that's focusing on this as an in vivo delivery approach. And then lentivirus is, is really the way that we've used the most to, to modify T cells in the dish, but we're also now using for in vivo delivery as well. The other way that we're interested in, in um, doing an in vivo delivery approach is with nanoparticles. And this is, has been science fiction for a long time, but has, has really emerged as a very promising way to, to uh, go forward with in vivo delivery. There's a lot of, of different ways to do this. You can make different size particles, different stuff that you're putting on the surface of those particles. They can be a different shape. They can be made of different uh, materials. So I'm just going to highlight two here, and, and one is from Jen and her former postdoc Reza, who just started his own lab at the at Indiana University. They're using a gold nanoparticle, which you can see here is just a very very small piece of gold. So not unfortunately that valuable, but it is valuable scientifically, and that we can decorate it with all kinds of therapeutics that we would want DNA and RNA and proteins that can do very di diverse sorts of of uh, approaches to edit cells in the body. The other one is one that, that I already mentioned to you, and that's lipid nanoparticles. Um, this is something that we're looking at as a way to vaccinate our CAR T cells. And this is the approach that's been used both by Moderna and Pfizer, Pfizer BioNTech in their COVID-19 vaccines. And I'm showing here um, Drew Weissman, who's one of the fathers of, of this type of nanoparticle approach, uh, receiving his COVID-19 uh, vaccine uh, late last year in, in Philadelphia. So the I'm not going to get into any of the specifics with uh, that of how we're doing this for the purposes of time, but the essential idea here is that instead of getting to this point where we have a CAR T cell that's that's lo locating our cell of interest by taking those cells out, modifying them in a sterile facility, and then putting them back in and having these cells in the body, what instead that we want to do is have a, a vector that's directly going to package all of the material that we need and just put that directly into the bloodstream so that we can make those cells in the body without having to remove them and handle them in specialized facilities. 
So just to wrap up the, the in vivo delivery part, I, I, I just want to summarize again that the viral vectors and nanoparticles have pros and cons. Um, the pros of the viral vectors are that they've evolved to navigate the body and, and know how to target a cell type of interest. The problem is that the immune system has also seen them. And so I, I talked a little bit about um, convincing the immune system that these are friends, not foes. And, and that's something that um, we have to do very carefully, but also uh, to a, a high degree of, of success to get these viral vectors to work. The nanoparticles, uh, in my personal opinion, are, are, are still qu quite in development. There's a, a, a numerous different ways that they can be made and it's still not completely clear which are gonna be the best. Uh, my personal view is that there are gonna be some that are better for diseases A, B, and C and others that are better for X, Y, and Z. And it's a me measure of that playing out in the types of preclinical models um, that we focus on and, and addressing whether the, some are better for cancer, HIV, et cetera. And then wrapping up, this is my last slide, is, is where what I've told you about today is our, our current paradigms for HIV gene therapy and really two of them. One is our stem cell approaches. And the pro here is that we can protect the entire immune system and modify all of the different blood, site, blood cell types in the body. But there are a lot more issues of toxicity that we have to overcome. Lymphocyte gene therapy, on the other hand, like uh, T cell, CAR T cells, as well as the B cell approaches I mentioned, are much less toxic, but don't seem to be as robust. And, and so we have to go to a little bit more of an effort, as I showed you, for the, the vaccine, vaccination of these CAR T cells, for instance, to get them to work. But where we want to go is uh, these in vivo delivery approaches. So we can deliver, excuse me, deliver these uh, tools straight to the body, to the bone marrow, to tissues, using viral vectors or nanoparticles. And, and again, the, the key here is for them to be very, very specific. And that's what we're focused most on right now. So I'll stop there and, and, and thank um, our lab for all their, their help and support in this project, namely Hans Peter for, for his mentorship um, on all the work I've done. Um, my team is shown here in blue along with our, our vector core, which makes all the vectors we use. I especially wanted to highlight um, Jim Riley's lab at UPenn, who's been very supportive of the CD4 car work, um, our colleagues at the private center and, and the PDHIV and our funding sources as well. So thank you very much. <laughs>